pray you are well this Advent season and welcome back to the Embrace webinar series. My name is Claire Nicholson McClun and I serve as a resource developer with Make and Deepen Disciples of the Evangelical Covenant Church. And today I am co-hosting with Michelle Sanchez, Executive Minister of Make and Deepen Disciples. This is Embrace Webinar 28, and today we're having a conversation with Dr. Mark Yarhouse, author of many books on gender and sexual identity, including co-author of a newly published book, Gender, Identity, and Faith, and that's the focus of our conversation today. Embrace is a suite of human sexuality discipleship resources and experiences which are curated and created by Make and Deepen Disciples. Embrace resources are in harmony with the adopted position of the Evangelical Covenant Church, the center of which is the Christian standard is faithfulness and heterosexual marriage and celibacy and singleness. And you can go to covchurch.org forward slash embrace to learn more. A special emphasis of Embrace is equipping the church to flourish in love for family and friends who identify as LGBTQ+. And yes, it's good to see y'all again. My name is Michelle Sanchez, and I just want to say, okay, I have the privilege of introducing Mark Yarhouse, but before I do, I want to let you know that Mark is someone that we have very much wanted to join our Embrace series for some time. I mean, like over a year, we have wanted to have a conversation with Mark. And so the fact that he's able to join us today, uh, we are incredibly grateful to have him and that he's willing to bless us with his wisdom. Some background on Mark. Mark is the D Dr. Author P. Retch and Mrs. Jean May Retch Endowed Chair and Professor of Psychology at Wheaton College, where he directs the Sexual and Gender Identity Institute, and he serves as a core faculty member in the doctoral program in clinical psychology. He is a licensed clinical psychologist. Yarhouse has published over 80 peer-reviewed journal articles. I'll say that again, over 80 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters and is the author or co-author of many books, including Understanding Gender Dysphoria, Understanding Sexual Identity, um, and a number of other books. I'm not even gonna, just Google it, okay. Uh, he also serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Psychology and Theology and as an ad hoc reviewer with the Journal of Homosexuality. Okay, so I will also just uh, throw this in for you all, one of the unique aspects today um, and trying to make really the most of our time with Mark is that we are going to be doing something we haven't done before in the same way, and that is engaging in some case studies. So uh, we're going to engage at least three specific case studies with you all today. Um, and these are case studies that are coming from Mark's work and writing. And it will be, uh, again, just a great honor to be able to engage with him over very specific instances, cases, and stories that represent real lives and real people. Um, now, as always, we also want to make sure that we are engaging questions that you have. And so please, throughout the uh, webinar, anytime, you can add your questions to the Q&A section, and we will get to as many of those as we can. All right. Well, welcome, Mark. Once again, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Claire. Uh, it's a real delight to be with you and just to have some time maybe to think through some of these uh, topics and some of the cases a little, little bit more detailed than we might ordinarily have. So thank you for that opportunity. All right. So I like to begin these conversations with asking a little bit about who our presenter is. So could you tell us a little bit of your story? And in particular, how did you come to focus your research on matters related to sexuality, gender identity, and faith? And um, 
you know, I, I just want to note, you really started that journey way before it became kind of a, a hot topic to write about. You were already deeply invested. And so tell us a little bit about that story. And also, how did you come to write your latest book on gender identity and faith? You know, when I, I, it goes back to when I was in graduate school and I was invited to be a research assistant for the department chair at uh, the school I was at Wheaton College. And it was such an honor to be asked by him that I just said yes without knowing what we were going to be working on. And I went to the first meeting and he had three lines of research, but one of them was on sexual orientation. And I had a background in philosophy and he wanted to look at both the scientific research um, that was used in a number of mainline church uh, task forces and things like that, and how then what was the logical relationship between the findings of science and the moral conclusions that were being drawn by those task forces. So I ended up working with him for about four years, five years. He became the senior academic officer at Wheaton. So he really had a demanding administrative schedule that wouldn't let him speak or write or present unless his research assistant did. So I did a lot of that um, at a pretty early age. And then um, when I graduated, I, I looked around and I just didn't find anybody in psychology who was a Christian studying these topics. And the Christians outside of my field didn't seem to know the research that I had been studying for the last four or five years. And so um, I held it loosely. I, it wasn't what I went to school to study, but there was definitely a need. There, there, a lot of doors opened. A lot of people had questions. A lot of churches wanted guidance. Families would come in for therapy. And so I ended up, you know, that's almost 25 years ago. So, uh, so yeah, I've done a lot of research in that time. Um, a lot of providing counseling services to individuals, couples, families, and, um, I think when I started, I was fairly dispassionate about it because it wasn't like I had an ax to grind on this topic. Or, um, and I think that served me pretty well in terms of dialogues around these issues. I would talk like I'm talking to you now. And uh, I would say over the 25 years, though, I do care deeply about the topic today. Um, so uh, the dispassion might be more of a reflection of my... Um, my temperament and my personality, uh, more of an introvert and a little more soft-spoken, but I'm not, um, but, but, I, but I have a number of students who have wanted to study with me who are part of this population that we're talking about, and a number of just families and friends have touched me deeply in this area. So um, yeah, so that's a little bit about my background on it. Um, so I did a lot on sexual orientation, but I would always get referrals on gender, even if families didn't understand that it was on gender, they would have maybe a child who was different than their peers for gender related reasons. And parents were wondering what that meant. And so it was nothing like it is today where um, gender identity has really become um, more central in cultural discourse. So, uh, so I actually never thought it would become what it has become today. So that's a little bit of it that which we can talk about if you want. But then um, the book, I had written a book on how I approach sexual orientation and identity in therapy, and I uh, thought about a couple of years later, should I do something like that on gender? A number of clinicians were asking me for that kind of resource, and I had had some workbooks I developed, but nothing like a book that would explain how I actually approach counseling with people. And one of my former students, Julie, Dr. Julia Sadusky, um, she works in this area. You've had her on your podcast before, and is a good friend and colleague. And we decided we would collaborate on this book and really share what, how we would approach the complexities of gender identity, particularly among conventionally religious people who really wanna take their faith seriously and wanna take their gender seriously and are trying to figure this out. It's, it's really a book written for um, other clinicians. It's, it's not written for the broader public, although a number of people have shared with me that they've gained something from it. And it um, wasn't even really written for Christian counselors. It was really written like, here's here's kind of a, um,
a third way approach to this, uh, and um, it's meant to reflect some nuance in sort of balancing different considerations when you work with families. So that was, that's, that's what led to this book. I just want to say um, what really, one of the things that jumped out to me from what you just said was something like, we needed more um, research and investment in terms of the connection between um, science and our moral conclusions. I really, really like how, how you put that. And I think, you know, much of the Embrace series has been um, mm. investigating, you know, the, the kind of realities as, as people are experiencing them in the world, but also the moral conclusions that we read in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Claire, yeah. you can go ahead. Yeah, so that really leads into this next question. Mark of you and co-author Dr. Sh Julia Sadusky, who we've had on a previous webinar, have named the importance of staying attuned to culture as people navigate gender identity questions. So could you help us understand the cultural, ideological, and political polarization surrounding care for people navigating gender identity questions today? Yeah, I mean, you, you can sort of see it even in just, uh, I'm not really involved in this this kind of thing, but legislation in different states, some wanting to um, ban medically, what's called medically affirmative care for minors, other states um, wanting to really emphasize the importance of it. So there's like, whenever legislation's involved, it's usually because things have gotten polarized and there's there's a, there's an element of that going on here. Um, and the way that I tend to think about it is through different lenses through which people see this topic. And in my previous writing, and I, I allude to it in other books, including Gender Identity and Faith, I talk about three different lenses through which people see this topic. And I'm not saying this is exhaustive. This is just three that stood out to me as I was looking at how people disagree with one another and why. So the first one I called um, integrity, and it, I'm using the language of each of the, the proponents of that view. And this lens really was about the integrity of male-female differences that God intended at creation. So the people who are drawn mostly to this lens are conventionally religious people who would be citing stories of creation from Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and really seeing that God created the complementary relationship of male and female that's meant to be brought together in what Christians refer to as a covenant of marriage. And it's outside of that um, that sexual behavior would be morally impermissible, but to our topic, the adopting of a cross-gender or other gender identity would be viewed as morally impermissible. But you can hear in this language the emphasis on what's right or wrong, that it would be um, sinful or be wrong, it would be impermissible to adopt different experiences of gender. Um, and then that has to do then with transitioning socially, medically, all the different things that would go into that. Um, so it's often a, a moral concern to be corrected. And correction here is often thought of in ministry circles as restoring creational intent. What did God intend at creation and how do we minister or counsel to restore creational intent? Uh, the second lens I called disability, and I, um, I don't know if that's the best word for it, but I was trying to, I was using the language of a proponent of the perspective. And um, and it would be more like these are variations in gender that exist in nature. And over several dozens of cases, you would expect there to be variations. For most people, their gender identity corresponds with their biological markers like chromosomes, gonads, genitalia. For a small percentage of people, it doesn't. So why wouldn't it? Well, there's a variation that occurs in nature. It's a non-moral reality that we would respond to with compassion. Sort of like if someone has hearing loss or um, they're blind, you know, there's just different experiences where, okay, something's not functioning properly, but it's not a moral issue, even though at one time for Christians or for uh, like in the, in the New Testament, the disciples go to Jesus and they say, why was this man born blind in John 9? And they, and he says, uh, they say, is it because he sinned or did his parents sin? And Jesus says, uh, neither. <laughs> it's that so God's, God can be glorified in this. And so um, 
we're not that far removed from the disciples in terms of saying, is this sin by this person? Is it their parents? What, you know, what did this? But this group would see more of, uh, they would believe in Genesis 1 and 2, but they would emphasize Genesis 3 and the story of the fall more. How do I help someone live with a, a besetting condition, an enduring reality? It's very different than restoring creational intent. So different ministry focus. Then the third lens is the lens I referred to as diversity. And this is the lens where my field psychology is. Um, it's where our society is rapidly moving toward. But how do we view um, different gender identities? Well, we view them as expressions of a culture to be celebrated. And there's no doubt that the LGBTQ community has emerged as a culture in Western society in the last 50 or 60 years. No doubt about that. And so I think for some people viewing um, a discordant gender identity as a reflection of that culture to be celebrated is uh, another way to come at this. So those three lenses coexist within our churches, within our families, within society, and much of the political and ideological debate is between, especially the first lens of integrity and the third lens of diversity. And legislating around that or arguing and making points about that has often led to polarization, I would say, largely between those two groups. That's so hopeful of <laughs> the integrity, disability, and diversity, and where people connect it back to Genesis 1 through 3 and how we see diversity played out in our culture today. Um, and with those three lenses, and you do speak about this, um, and emerging gender identities along with gender identity and faith. How does integrating those three lenses that you just mentioned help us better embody a posture of love? You know, when I got done thinking about the three lenses, I, I realized there was, a, there was a problem. The problem was that each of the lenses brought something unique to the table. And I didn't want the reader to think, well, I'll just pick my lens and I'll just jump into the culture war. Like, here's my here's my position. I really wanted Christians to think a little, a little more um, self-reflective, a little more nuanced. Think about what are the strengths of each of the lenses and could they be integrated into a lens that shared some features of the primary lenses so that that would sort of, um, I don't know, renew and sort of uh, help mobilize ministry and, and how people would think about this. So I think, you know, I don't know that we'll have any consensus uh, about the best way to integrate the three lenses, but I would say for me, I think, I do think a biblically faithful starting point is with the first lens. But I, th I do think the stories of creation do establish norms. They're not just descriptive of what happened, but they're, they're norms that are meant to inform principles that we apply to human sexuality and gender. And so um, I think that is a, a biblically faithful starting point. But I don't think the ministry that's come out of it, the counseling that's come out of it, has been very helpful to people, uh, especially when people talk about it as like a willful disobedience, like a this person's made a bad set of choices. And if they just could walk that back and make better choices, this would go away. There really isn't good evidence to support a, an approach like that, a ministry response like that. And um, the, the idea that you could restore creational intent is concerning because I, I don't know that we have good evidence that we can do that. And is that actually end up being painful for people when people have tried that? So there's a lot of more questions than answers that come up with the practical components of that. What I like about the second lens is I, I like the compassion and I like the empathy that comes from that. Uh, I love, you know, a lot of the people that I've worked with have kind of an enduring experience of this it's an enduring reality in their life how so moving them away from the idea of restoring creational intent to how do you grow in the depth and sincerity of your faith with an enduring reality i think that's been a better repositioning of this conversation the third lens a lot of people ask me what um what i get from the third lens aren't you at war with the third lens and i would say no i'm not i'm actually i'm not at war with the third lens i'm trying to avoid you know i think christians should rise above the culture wars and really think more about um, how we want to position ourselves within a diverse and pluralistic society. But I don't think that that's the best posture is to, is to be culture warrior. I think um, 
what the third lens brings to the table is a sense of identity and a sense of community. And that is not achieved as well from the first two lenses. Thinking about it as just a bad series of choices when the person says, I know I didn't choose this, you've already lost that person. The second one, by framing it as things not functioning properly, for some people that resonates, uh, they'll be comfortable using phrases like gender dysphoria, but there's plenty of people who wouldn't be comfortable with that language. And what they get from the third lens is a sense of identity. I'm part of the transgender community. I'm part of this larger group of uh, people who are like me in, in meaningful ways. And it gives them that sense of identity and community. And I might not agree with all of the answers that come out of that lens, but I have to at least acknowledge that the lens offers something compelling for the majority of people navigating this space in terms of identity and community. And I think that the, if the church really wants to minister effectively to this population, it has to address fundamental longings for identity and community that are not being addressed in the way that the first two lenses frame the issues. So that's that's kind of where I draw on that third lens and pull together this kind of integrated lens of the three. Hey, Mark, we just had a question come in, which I want to make sure to ask right now while it's relevant, and that is, where is the best place for people to go to read about these three lenses, um, really get an in-depth introduction to them, integrity, disability, and diversity? Yeah, so I first introduced them in a book called Understanding Gender Dysphoria. Um, that's through um, InterVarsity Press and Academic, and there's an introduction to it, because that's when I was trying to work it out. That came out in 2015. But it definitely lays the foundations for sort of how do we understand gender, gender dysphoria, transgender experiences, how do these lenses, what am I seeing, what's the lay of the land? Um, I, Julia and I do return to them in, in a bit of depth in emerging gender identities, and we try to unpack the theological underpinnings of each. So that might be a nice one-two uh, consideration for reading about them. Thank you. Well, that's so helpful. Those three lenses to help frame the conversation and seeing the contributions of, of each one of those um, and how we can integrate those within the church. Um, so thank you for that. And you just mentioned a number of books <laughs> that you've written. And we believe that language and terminology is important. And so you just mentioned um, where people can learn more about the three lenses, understanding gender dysphoria and emerging gender identities. So those are two different terminologies. So would you briefly define and differentiate gender dysphoria and emerging gender identities for us? Yeah, so gender dysphoria refers to the distress that some people report when their gender identity as a man or a woman doesn't correspond with their biological markers like chromosomes, gonads, genitalia. And so for the vast majority of people, though there's a there's a correspondence between those. For a small percentage of people, there's a discordance. And when that is distressing to the person, we call it dysphoria, gender dysphoria. So dysphoria is a negative emotional state, like euphoria is a positive emotional state. Dysphoria is a negative emotional state tied to that discordance. And um, emerging gender identities is the phrase I use to describe, it's really under the non-binary umbrella. So let me define that and then I'll get into this. So transgender usually refers to a cross-gender identity. It's, it's like a transatlantic flight spans across the Atlantic to the other side. And so Classically, it would be the experience of someone who says, I'm a woman trapped in the body of a man. So I, my identity crosses the binary. But for some people, they would say, my gender identity is outside of that binary, or it's in between the binary. And the language for that has been gender non-binary. That's, that's kind of the, another umbrella term. So under that umbrella of non-binary is what I would call emerging gender identities. And these are I will not define all of these, but this is, you know, when someone says I'm agender, I'm bigender, I'm pangender, I'm masculine presenting, I'm feminine of center, I'm gray gender, I'm gender expansive, I'm gender creative. There are dozens and dozens of different kind of splintering of gender categories. 
And part of what we say in the Emerging Gender Identities book is um, that vast array of gender possibilities is what a 14 or 15 year old grows up in today. And they are parented or in youth group with people who never were exposed to that wide array of gender categories. They never, their parents, their grandparents never navigated the linguistic constructs, the, the language, the, the meaning making structures that their 14 year old is navigating. And that makes it really difficult for ministry and parenting and all the things that we care about become really complicated when we're not even uh, that familiar with language and categories of that nature. And so that's that's kind of what that what I refer to as emerging gender identities. One thing I do like to clarify for people, Mark, is, um, and actually you can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, but we do not want to equate the word trans with gender dysphoria. They are, they are different um, terms and they, and a lot of people who are trans or identify as trans, you know, may not say that they have gender dysphoria or even experience that. So uh, could you also just speak to that, uh, the difference between the, the terms gender dysphoria and someone who's identifying as trans? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely many people in the transgender community who don't like the phrase at all, just because it's psychiatric and medical, and it comes from a place that didn't originate within the transgender community. Uh, in fact, the use of the word transgender as an umbrella term for the community was chosen by the community, and it is the preferred designation for, for their experience. And, um, you know, there's other terminology, other words that historically referred to this group of people that are more medical, more psychiatric, more pathologizing. So gender dysphoria for some people feels like that. And, um, and others are comfortable with it. They realize, and it, what, you're, what we're really pointing to here, Michelle, is we're pointing to lenses. So the people who are comfortable with it are probably comfortable because they see it out of that second lens of something not functioning properly. Well, how do you describe that gender dysphoria? Other people would say, well, I don't see it as something not functioning properly. I'm functioning just fine, but you don't understand who I am. I'm transgender. And so I think that's part of what we're getting at here is the lenses function every day in these considerations. And so for the Christian, you really want to have the lay of the land as your, let's, I'm assuming that this is not your story, this is not your journey, but it might be. But if it wasn't, you'd want to understand the lay of the land and how different people are using different lenses to talk about and see the same things. And they'll have a different response to words like gender dysphoria, or they'll equate that with transgender. And other people would say, no, it's not that at all. And that's a reflection of lenses uh, in, in many respects. Thank you for that. It's helpful to have clarity with language and terminology and what it means to different people. Um, it is intercultural work <laughs> and intergenerational work, which I appreciated how you equipped even for conversations for that, you and your co-author um, and emerging gender identities of that, that intergenerational <laughs> work, because there is that. Um, that is present in these conversations. And so for the sake of time, we are going to shift to some case studies. Um, you had mentioned gender identity and faith is really for clinicians. And so we wanna translate your wisdom, Mark, <laughs> your 25 years of wisdom in this area for pastors and parents who are tuning in to this webinar. So Michelle's gonna lead this section. And if you have any questions, please be sure to type those in now to the live Q&A chat feature so that we reserve enough time to answer your questions at the end. All right. So right before we dive into case study, there was another question that came in. And I think this is a good moment to ask it as we are doing the definitions piece. Um, so we'll dive in just a moment to the case studies. One thing that is challenging is to know what kids are really trans and what kids have adopted some kind of gender fluidity language as a sort of cultural fad. 
Our kids in middle school and high school are hearing constant chatter about people who claim to be non-binary or transitioning, et cetera. So this, this is a good question, I think, because um, it is getting into, well, it's trendy to um, be trans or identify with some kind of gender fluidity. So how, how do we tell the difference between that and, and something else? I'll let, you, I'll let you fill that out. Yeah, it is a great question. It's, not a, it's a simple question to ask. It's not a simple question to answer. It's a very complex question. And um, people who work in this area have a difficult time sorting out some of these things, which is probably not going to be encouraging to your listeners. But, um, you know, most gender clinics do, are, are, in, are supposed to do comprehensive interviews around gender. And those interviews can help tease that out a little bit. And um, you're, there's a lot of types of questions you ask about their childhood, about their uh, life today, about their interests, about um, a number of things that are part of diagnostic criteria. Now, this moves us into a that second lens of mental health issues. Um, other people would not be drawn to this. They don't like gender clinics. They don't like the gatekeeping status of those clinics for services. So I want to be, again, lay of the land here is that not everybody likes the way I'm going to frame this, but I'm really just framing how people like me figure that out is we take a lot of time to do careful interviewing and and space out our time with people to see if this is something that um, there, if there's any evidence of the person sort of searching for identity and searching for community and landing on this as a culturally salient phenomenon. And a generation ago, they might have landed on something else, but today they're landing on this. But I don't, I hesitate to even say that because I don't think that's been most of the experiences that come to my clinic. The people who come to my clinic are typically genuinely experiencing dysphoria. They're wanting help navigating this space. And maybe that's one good clarification that a number of transgender people who wouldn't resonate with the language of dysphoria wouldn't go to a specialty clinic necessarily because they don't, they don't want to have a diagnosis or they don't, they don't see it that way. Um, I think what some people do is they'll go to a clinic because they want certain interventions and they believe that having the endorsement of a mental health professional will aid in getting those. And that's led to a tenuous relationship sometimes between the mental health community and the transgender community is, do we rely on you for access to these? Are you a gatekeeper? Those types of things. So anyway, um, I think it's, it's hard to work out like in youth ministry, it's hard to work out as a parent. It's hard for me to work out and I work in this area, but the way that I work it out is I do more careful extended evaluations. And I look at the kinds of things that parents are concerned about, like peer group influence, social media, things like that, alongside other considerations. And I try to give my best, you know, determination. What do I think is going on here? Do I think this is um, really the experience of gender dysphoria? Is there something else going on? Are there other co-occurring mental health issues going on? that make it hard to see this, like an anxiety disorder, or depression. Um, so uh, that's all, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'll, that's the reason I said it's a, it's a quick question, but it's not a quick answer. There's a lot that goes into that. And I'm, I'm probably not even doing justice to it with this answer, how, how complicated that can be. Oh, I, I don't envy the explanations that you need to give to people because there are no easy explanations. Um, which is why I really salute you for even trying to do so. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the word that in that question that stood out to me was the word trend. Um, how do we know that they're not just engaging in a trend? And so there's something to me about the persistence of a person's experience. I mean, kids are yeah. famous for, you know, experimentation. I mean, you know, they try on lots of different identities and things, but there is also that piece about um, what, what, what is the distress that they're experiencing and then the persistence of that. Um, that I think comes into play as well. But again, thank you. Thank you for shedding some light. And I want to make sure that we uh, do get to these case studies here. So uh, first one, Nate and Vicki are, oh, there is a, oh, we have a slide. This is wonderful. Okay, I'll just read from the slide. Nate and Vicki are parents in their late 30s with a seven-year-old natal male. They recall that as far back as two years ago, uh, Logan asked to wear a dress outside as part of a game with his sisters. In the last eight months or so, Logan has talked about wanting to be a girl, 
Two months ago, Logan put on a dress and tights and said to his mother, I wish God made me a girl. Most of Logan's gender atypical behavior has to do with clothing and hair. Logan will sometimes put a towel around his head and declare to his mother, I've got long hair like you have long hair. Okay, so we know from your work, Mark, that the quality of the parent-child relationship is really the most significant predictor of a child's well-being over time. So with that in mind, what counsel would you give to Logan's parents? Yeah, a lot of this, this so a lot of the cases are kind of built around um, things that we were trying to teach teach in the book. And I, if I remember this, uh, I think it was around um, an important principle that we encourage parents to adopt is to try to reduce fear-based parenting. And most parents would tell me or tell you in hindsight that their best parenting didn't occur when they parented out of their fears. And uh, that's been true for me as a parent. It's true for many people. But um, when when a child is expressing themselves in ways that are unexpected around their gender. So sometimes we'll use the phrase gender atypical, but that's uh, falling out a bit in, in preference. But the idea of um, they're different than their peers for gender related reasons. Um, that can create a lot of anxiety for parents, a lot of fear for parents. And so when parents respond out of fear, sometimes they'll do things that they regret. They might overcompensate or say, well, my son's not behaving the way other boys behave by taking that towel and doing that way. So I'm going to grab that towel and like, and I'm going to shame him. And I'm going to tell him that's not what boys do. I mean, get out of my high heels. That's not what boys do. And, um, uh, and they might then do that as well as let's, let's kind of help you toughen up. Let's make you really a boy. And then they're drawing on stereotypes about what boys should be like to sort of make them not have this interest in the towel or the long hair or the shoes or whatever, you know? And so if we can help parents reduce fear-based parenting, you can help the parent respond in that moment. Um, and the way you do reduce fear-based parenting is you help them talk about that, name the fears, talk about that in counseling, talk about that with a boundary between that process and their relating to their child. So they get to name the fear, but not to the child. They name the fear to uh, a good friend, a confidant, someone in ministry, someone in counseling, and they process through that fear. And what are your what kind of what are the what are the worst case scenarios that you're worried about? And where does that fear come from? And what do you you know? So you kind of work through that fear with them, and then they can turn and be with their child and react and respond in ways that are more measured and more calm. And so. A lot of kids might play the way that this is the other thing that comes up with a case study like this is that a lot of kids might do what's in this case study. So that doesn't mean they have gender dysphoria or that they're transgender. You know, it's just within the realm of possibilities of what, because I get a lot of parents come to me and say, well, my kid did that. My kid did that. They turned out fine. Here's my child. You know, so I'm not saying that that means they're transgender or have gender dysphoria. I'm just saying um, in many cases, a parent could just say, oh, that's where my towel went. I thought I put it that in the hamper. And then they could sort of redirect their child to something else. And most kids are going to redirect to other things. They're, they're not that fixated on the towel, the long hair, or things like that. Um, oh, those are my nice high heels. Let's go ahead and put those over here. Maybe we can find a, a, some shoes to play with in the other room. They'll just redirect them. And it's not a um, shaming response. It's not in the vast majority of cases, it means nothing. The child just wanted to play with something that was around them and they were having fun with it. And so if we overreact to that, uh, we create undue, I think, tension in our relationship with our child. Our fears come out sideways. Uh, it seems punitive to them. Uh, they feel like they're not enough. Um, you know, if it persists, it continues. There may be something there and we could look at that. Um, but it would, like you said earlier, Michelle, would persist. There would be sort of an insistence. There's, there's other criteria that go into this. At some point, a child would say, I am a girl, or I, I, um, they would find language for what they're trying to say. Now, some kids have a harder time with that. They might be hinting at it with, I wish God made me this way, or I want to be this way. That may or may not signal anything. There might be just advantages to being a girl or being a boy within their sphere of social influence. And that might be why they say that, but there, it might be an underlying 
experience, and that will take some time to discover. That's not going to be found out through this kind of brief exchange. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to our second case study, which concerns hormone treatment. Bertrand, age 11, was brought in to meet with his youth leader by his parents. He has been demonstrating gender atypical behavior and interests for several years. He was nearing the onset of puberty and his parents were struggling with whether to block puberty and give Bertie and themselves a little more time to decide the best way forward in terms of gender identity. What counsel would you give to the youth leader providing pastoral care to Bertie and his parents? Well, one of the things that stood out to me about this case was most of the time, parents don't bring that to a youth leader or to the church in terms of the process. They, um, in a sense, are inviting the youth minister to be part of a multidisciplinary team that is, that is responding to what Bertie's experiencing. They're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, most of the churches I've worked with, the families kind of made that decision on their own with their multidisciplinary team, and they've let the church know what, they're, what they've are what they done. So here's what we've decided, just letting you know. I remember working with a church where the, it was a single mother and her son, and, and they were in, um, I think, elementary school, but they had, you know, were calling the church office just saying, look, I, we're heading into the summer. I wanted you to know that our our child is transitioning, and when we come back in the fall, uh, we would like them in the in the girls' programming of the church. Just wanted to let you know. And it was almost like a voicemail, you know, and it was like, whoa, the church had not even thought about this topic, let alone easy pivot to just bringing in the child as a girl. And they were scrambling on what to do and uh, what what could we do. But that that's a little bit more typical in my experience is the church is not brought in to the decision-making process. So that stands out to me from the front end. It's an, how do I put this? It's an honor to be invited into the journey itself that doesn't have easy answers. And, you know, if I'm in youth ministry and I'm talking with the family, I might ask them a little bit about how, you know, tell me a little bit about how, you know, what what's preceded this time I'm having with you. I've always loved, you know, your child. I've loved having them in youth ministry. And, you know, be careful here with names and pronouns uh, to be sensitive to kind of where the family is. I, uh, well, uh, this, my position on this has generated the most email I've ever received. Um, so I'm going to, I'll say it, but there's no need to email me. I, I got you. But I, I generally use the name and pronouns that the person uses. The only exception would be minors where the parents are not uh, agreeing to that at this moment. And when that happens in counseling, I just stop the session and I say, okay, I, I, I need you guys to talk together about what to do next, because the next thing I say, I'm going to either lose you, mom, or I'm going to lose you, teenager, and I need you guys to decide. And they always figure it out. Uh, mom, sometimes mom or dad says, you know, we're just new to this. It's okay. Uh, it's more important they have someone to talk to. And I've had the teenager say, look, I, I've only been do told you about this like a month ago. I get it, but I want to revisit this. If we're going to make this concession, I want to revisit this. Or they come up with a nickname or something they used to call them when they were younger. So they work it out. But um, but generally, you know, be careful about things like that in youth ministry. Um, and then I would thank them for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, what has been part of the experiences that you've had that brought you to this point? What are some of the things that you're weighing? What are you considering? Um, now, because I know a bit about this, I might ask a little bit more information about what they were told in terms of side effects and sort of where things go from here. And I might help them have a better informed conversation if they're seeing a pediatric endocrinologist. You know, I might write down a list of things that they might ask them about because sometimes when professionals go over consent, it might be written out but not really explained. Um, and I know for me, I tend to sign things without reading everything that I was like, oh, I just agreed to that. Um, and I, I need some time to process it and talk it through. So I might help them think through some of that. I think in youth ministry, you're also asking about the spiritual dimensions of sort of where your where their faith has been a part of the conversation. Um, how has the journey itself raised questions for them in their faith? How have they been able 
to talk with that with me or with anybody else in youth ministry or church. Like I want the church to be a resource to the very spiritual questions that the church, that's, that's sort of the, in a multidisciplinary team, that's sort of the expertise the church brings is sort of the faith journey component. What is the walk of faith been like for the family? What are the questions that they've been asking of God? Um, they might be asking, you know, how do we respond to difficulty or hardship in our life? If this feels like suffering, why does God allow this? Like these are basic questions that are sometimes in the category of theodicy or a theology of evil and suffering. Like why do we exist in a world with a with a benevolent God who is all good, all loving, and all knowing, and yet we suffer from painful things? Why is like those are those are very those are very common questions that every most clients ask in mental health period, let alone gender diverse experiences. So those are the types of things I'd want to work on. Wow. Um, you know, for, for time's sake, we're going to move on to get some of these questions in from our, um, our listeners. But I, I do want to say that one of the things that stood out to me from your explanation just now was that, you know, um, often the, the particular advice or, or whatever around gender is not the main thing you, you want to work on, you know, okay, um, the, the bigger picture, the context, relationships of, of this person and their family or their friends. You want to talk about their faith, you know, their relationship with God. And I think all of that can sometimes, uh, because of our fears or lack of understanding, um, get you know, narrowed. And so that's one of the things I do appreciate about you is that you say, okay, let's take this wider. And then sometimes in that process, uh, questions can be resolved on the way, which feels a lot like what Jesus did too. <laughs> but, you know, I'm the discipleship person. Um, okay. So like I said, let's get to some of these, these questions that are, have come in. Um, okay. So uh, we have had Preston Sprinkle on twice uh, onto the webinar, Embrace webinar series. And as you know, he, or I'm assuming you know, he uh, recently wrote a book called Embodied, which is essentially um, looking at gender identity. So someone is asking, uh, I recently read Embodied by Preston Sprinkle and found it helpful. How does it compare to your research? Um, or how does it fit into the three lenses you mentioned? So any thoughts you have um, in terms of this comparative question, I think people would appreciate. Yeah, I was really excited for his book, um, you know, because I write as a psychologist who sees people all the time navigating this space. And, um, you know, I have a theological degree, but not that's not my primary um, area of scholarship and uh, so Preston has that background and he brings that to the table. So I was really looking forward to that. And there's a lot that I really appreciate. I think he has a, it's a nice book that has a lot of, um, you can tell he's kind of working it through himself. Like he's he's grappling like everybody else with this. And I think he does a nice job sorting through uh, a lot of that. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty comparable. I think he's probably a little bit, um, uh, I, I don't want to put him in a lens that wouldn't seem fair because I think we're I think he's got a pretty integrated lens with a lot of different uh, nuances to it. So let me let me let me let me not do that. Um, so I think our slight integrations of our lenses are slightly different. So there are differences in our perspective, but they're not as great as you would see in uh, other with other writers. And so, um, you know, he's a friend of mine. I respect him as a scholar. I think it was a good contribution to the conversation. And so, um, yeah, I think that's where I'll leave that. Okay, another question. Language appears to be critical. What kinds of biblical language can help us in these conversations? So biblical language, um, can you unpack that a little bit for me? Well, uh, the way that I read this question is something like, um, maybe when we think about the scriptural categories, um, or the the meta narrative of the Bible, mm -hmm. possibly you know theological concepts that arise from the scriptures. Uh, that this is what I'm reading from the question. I got you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're, well, yeah. I, mean, I mentioned yeah, I mentioned like the uh, theodicy, like the theology of suffering and evil, things like that. 
but I usually re reference, you know, the four acts of the biblical drama of creation, the fall, redemption, and consummation. And so there is a sense of, uh, first of all, scripture doesn't say a lot about gender. It does assume what we today call gender, and it does present men and women and things like that. It, does, it doesn't have the categories that we're talking about. But I don't look to scripture for all that level of detail. I don't read it as a science book. I don't read it as a therapy book. I don't see it as a medical um, nosology. Like I, I just see it as a uh, as a love letter. Uh, as others have talked about between God and, and his people and his creation. And he invites us into this relationship with him. It's a beautiful testament to the relationship he wants us to have with him. But I don't look at it as a treatment manual for treating gender dysphoria or for conceptualizing all those things. So I hesitate. I, I think I think of two types of people here. There's chapter and verse type of people, and there's broad principles type of people. And I'm a broad principles of scripture type of person, not a chapter and verse type of person. So um, there's just not going to be a lot of chapters and verses on the phenomenon we call gender dysphoria or transgender experiences in scripture. Um, but there are broad principles on sexuality and gender that I think are captured in some of the lenses that I talked about from creation, from the stories of the fall. And then we're asking the question, what does it mean to live redemptively? What are we moving toward? Um, can you restore creational intent? Should you attempt to? Could you live with an enduring reality, anticipating you know, the groaning of creation, anticipating um, a new birth in, in, in eternity and, and, and the delight of the consummation of all things in eternity. So I'm a little bit more that direction, a little bit more uh, with gender dysphoria. How do I live with something that's not likely to resolve on its own? Um, and what are some ways to do that in a sensitive, kind of compassionate way? That's going to vary from person to person. Some people, I haven't said this, but gender dysphoria um, can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe. It can ebb and flow in severity in the same person throughout their life. If you had 10 people in front of you, they'd have different levels of severity. Um, so are we talking about a mild case? I have a friend of mine who has a mild experience of dysphoria. She presents as a, she's a, biologically, she's female. She presents as a woman. She wears baggy clothing, keeps her hair short. And she would say, look, I can do this. I can manage it this way. But my dysphoria is mild. Don't make what I can do the standard that everybody should do as though I'm a poster child for this experience. She wouldn't want that. Other people can't do what she's doing. And so you really have to work with people on a case-by-case -case basis rather than say, well, this is the principle we're going to apply to everybody. Um, and I think that's that seems in keeping with what Scripture teaches us as well, uh, is to care for the person in front of you. There's biblical principles that inform our ministry but it's not a cookie cutter. It's not a, it's not a template we lay on top of everybody and say, you got to do it this way. It's going to have to be a bit more uh, nuanced. I appreciate how many different hats you need to wear as you answer questions, because just now I said, hey, can you put on your Bible expositor hat and answer this question? Um, so uh, it, it is a challenge. This next question, um, it's a great question. And I suppose it's a little bit more of a theological hat but let me go ahead and ask it, um, get your thoughts. How might God's gender non-conforming identity, God's, and we emphasize that, how might God's gender non-conforming identity speak to the non-binary and gender expansive community? So that's that's part one. And I think what I'm getting from that is, well, you know, we know God is spirit, um, ultimately, uh, rather than male or female. Additionally, how might God's gender non-conforming identities speak to people who identify strongly with the gender binary. Okay, so let me know if you need to, re I need to read Yeah, that's a, great, what a great question. You have such a great audience. Um, so thank you for <laughs> that. Um, yeah, this is a little bit the theologian hat. Uh, so I, I feel like other people do this better than I do as a psychologist, but I, I did love, there's a little article by Heather Loy. Uh, she's a Canadian psychologist and she wrote about this in, uh, in a journal article some years ago, and I referenced her in Understanding Gender Dysphoria. But she talks about, she just kind of thinks out loud with her readership about the genderfulness of God. And she uses that word genderfulness, <laughs> which I thought, I've never heard that word. Um, 
And she, she speculates on why God made two genders. Why did God make male and female? Um, now, I know that that raises questions of other genders, so I'm not meaning to be antagonistic there. Just to say, in her writing, she was saying, why did God do this? And there was something about the differences in male and female that God seemed to say was needed to express the fullness of who he was revealing himself to be in creation, or his creation would be the image of God. Um, and that there was something about the gender fullness of male and female that was needed to express that. And so she kind of riffs on that for a bit. And I, I found that to be a very compelling angle of entry into the conversation um, that maybe raises more questions than answers. But I think there's something about that for people who are gender non-binary or gender non-conforming or transgender. Um, you know, you wonder if there's something um, about their experience, apart from the dysphoria, the distress of it, that might re represent something uh, to us about the gender fullness of God is something I would, that's the immediate thing that came to my mind. So Heather Loy uh, might be a resource for that. And then um, I think to, the, to others who are not experiencing their gender in this way, um, I think it helps us to not make our gender more than it is. Uh, to be to be humble stewards of the way that God's created us, but not to um, um, yeah, not to carry that with a kind of pride or carry that with a kind of um, way that um, puts it at, at, at odds with other people or that we're sort of in this battle for something. I, I think that would be a cautionary tale with with the way God is not gendered in the same way that we are. Um, so that, I think that's something I would consider. Uh, I love, um, and where you think there are truths here, because I think there are biblical truths here uh, for us to, to reflect on. I love Anne Lamott's quote in Bird by Bird, a book that she wrote on writing, actually, it has nothing to do with gender. But she says, um, you can chop with the sword of truth, but you can also point with it. And there's something about just, you know, as you grapple with this, you pray about this, you discern this, you ask God to speak to you about it. You can point to things without having to chop. You don't have to weaponize everything uh, when you're in these conversations around really difficult topics that require a lot of nuance and a lot of prayer and a lot of discernment, particularly when there's real lives at stake here, real lives walking this out. That it's not, it isn't solely a theological conversation, though that's important. It's not solely a psychological conversation, though that's important. These are real people walking out the psychological considerations and the theological considerations and the spiritual journey associated with it. And so you're, you're walking with them in ministry. I think that's a that's a, something I'd always want to return to. Mark, so we are basically at the end of our time, but we have so many questions here. <laughs> there are so many questions here. Um, if you have a few more minutes, I will, I do want to ask you, well, I'll read two more questions and then you can just answer them kind of briefly. Cause again, I'm sure yeah, people, that's right. I know, and none of them are stuff. easy. <laughs> that was a no, you have a hard job. So, Hey, you're doing great. Um, but let me just read two more and see if we could squeeze them in. And then we're going to, we're going to need to wrap it up. And we do have some announcements for everyone. Okay. Um, what advice do you give to families, churches, and schools when a male believes he's female and wants to play on female teams or feels the need to use female locker rooms and restrooms? Okay, so this one I think is a, a very practical question um, that you know many organizations and churches are needing to face. And then the last one is a nice expansive, uh, I think good question to close with. How do we as a parent, youth worker, or a mentor, Christ followers all, best love a child who is on the transgender journey. And so kind of any any final encouragements that you want to give regarding that? Yeah, the first question is really, um, it's complicated because um, it depends on kind of where they are in their experience of their gender. I mean, if someone has transitioned and you're asking about, you know, like restrooms and things like that, they, you wouldn't even know in most cases there, if, if they stopped at a restroom, you you would not want them to use the restroom that's associated with their chromosomes because they've already transitioned. They look nothing like what you would expect of a person to go to the restroom. So it becomes really complicated. Now, if they're on the front end of that 
it could be more dangerous for them. You know, and so there's a, there's a lot of complexity. When I work with people who are walking through this whole journey, you know, that's a conversation we come back to as they're in different, um, hitting different milestones in their own journey of, of this, of this uh, kind of walking this out. But it becomes complicated. And I, I think the three lenses inform policy for churches. Um, I know Christian institutions whose policies reflect the first lens. And there's a stated expectation that you'll live and present according to your biological markers. And it's almost functions as a filter that if you can't do that, it's not a good fit for you to be here in this church or in this Christian institution. Other, um, I've seen other organizations say, we understand that because of the fall, this is some people's experience, but you see the framing of it is the fall. And so we will work with you on a case-by-case -case basis on what's going to work for housing, for locker room, for restrooms. And I've seen um, Christian organization who said, Here, here's our transgender point of con contact. I'm glad you're here. Here's single stall bathrooms around the, the, fa the facilities. Here's, here's ways to be comfortable here. So the lenses are going to inform how you're going to write policy that affects that first question. Um, I don't think we've worked out the sports thing yet. I don't think, I think most of the sports policies have been rooted in hormones and hormones are one of many considerations in what makes it an even playing field for athletic uh, uh, for competition. So I think hormones has not been sufficient. And I think many people agree we're, we haven't quite figured it out yet. We need to keep working on this so that we can make this fair, recognizing the reality of some people's gender experience, but not putting them in a position where there's unfair competition. So that I think is work yet to be done. You know, walking with a child who's figuring this out is, um, you know, it's fraught. It's fraught. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, a lot of people just don't believe it's a real thing. Um, I do think that gender, so what we call today gender dysphoria, I do think this has occurred across cultures and throughout history. Some societies revere it. Some societies pathologize it. Some societies demonize it. Um, some criminalize it. And so I think we're at a moment right now where we're seeing our society move from pathologizing or moralizing it, seeing it in those categories, to celebrating it. And I think the church is kind of caught on its heels trying to figure out how do we respond with that dramatic shifting societal understanding of gender. So how do you do that? You walk with them carefully, gently, lovingly. Um, supportive, you know, not everything that they say means that it's exactly the way that it is. We'll see. Let let it let let's let this thing breathe. Let's let this thing. Let's see where things are over the next several months. Let's walk walk uh, at a good pace with people. I'd say have a long-standing relationship with people. Even holding those lenses in tension. If a older child moves from one way of seeing it to a different way of seeing it, do they lose you as a resource, or do you stay with them? no matter where the lenses may be in tension. I would argue for a steadfastness on our part of what I'm thinking of people who this is not your journey, walking with people through that, um, helping deepen their faith. Uh, a lot of people seem to want people to get the gender thing right before they have a relationship with Christ. I would say just the opposite. <laughs> like if they want to deepen their walk with Christ, help deepen their walk with Christ. It's that very relationship and the, um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we're going to count on in the months and years to come. So why wouldn't you want to disciple somebody and deepen them in their walk with Christ for the questions they'll be facing three years out, five years out, 10 years out? So I, I think about it a little bit more that way when I think of these kind of final thoughts on how you walk with somebody. Mark, we are so grateful for you. Thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. So glad I could be here. Michelle. Thank you. Thanks. Claire. Yes. Thank you, Mark, for pointing us to grace and truth and all the different hats <laughs> that you wore um, and the complex questions that were asked. Um, so much discernment is needed. And so um, we really appreciate you. I have a few invitations as we conclude. Um, the first is that you can sign up for our Embrace newsletter so you can be notified about um, future Embrace webinars as well as 
resources and events with Embrace Partners um, so that you can engage as you're able. And then we mentioned earlier that this is our fourth webinar that's connected to gender identity. And so you can go to the website, covchurch.org forward slash embrace. Um, and so we had Mark's co-author, Dr. Julia Sadusky, talk about their book, Emerging Gender Identities. Um, previously, there was a question about Dr. Preston Sprinkle and his book, Embodied, um, that we mentioned in this webinar. And then lastly, we had webinar seven, um, where there was a conversation about gender dysphoria and pastoral care. And Steve really drew from um, Mark's book about understanding gender dysphoria. And so thank you again for joining us. And we wish you a blessed rest of the Advent season and Merry Christmas, and we look forward to staying connected with you.